today, we are going to, uh, we're going to take a little journey. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share a couple of stories. Um, I, I like to share stories because it gives us an opportunity to try truth on without having to be fully offended by it. <laughs> you know, I, I, like, I like sharing the impact of what God, you know, has done in my own life. I like tattling on myself, really. And, uh, and it, gives, it gives people an opportunity to sort of see a window into their own life without it feeling, you know, too strong. Are you alive? Okay. So we're going to do a couple of those kinds of stories. And the invitation is that the Holy Spirit would speak to each one of our hearts and, uh, and that he would drop some wisdom in there so that uh, when we go at the end, we're going to minister today. We're going to spend a little bit of time just seeking the Lord on each other's behalf. And when we move into that place... God will have already talked to you about what he wants to do. And, uh, and so then when ministry takes place, there will be a release. People are going to get breakthrough today. All right? Look up here a sec, okay? You're already not making eye contact. Look up here, all right? <laughs> okay, that's not a good sign. Don't look, don't look at me. Listen, you're going to get breakthrough today. God is here. He's in our midst. He's speaking to hearts and lives, and he's causing us to be stirred, but there's a reason. It's because he wants to do something in your life, All right? It's going to be powerful, and uh, so you better buckle up. You ready? All right. Would you just put a hand on your own heart right now? I'm going to pray something specific for us. So the scripture says that there is a throne of grace, and so in prayer, we're coming before it. So Holy Father, right now, we come before your throne of grace. We are asking, Lord, that, uh, that you would grant to us sympathy and mercy and grace that we could approach what lies before us with your overcoming power, Lord, that our lives would be transformed and the world around us would be impacted, Father. And so I'm asking, God, that you would grant us, Lord, that you would anoint us, that we might boldly come before you in Jesus' name. This is Hebrews 4, starting in verse 14. Hebrews chapter 4, starting in verse 14, it says this. Since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest that cannot sympathize with our weakness, but one who has been tempted in all things and yet without sin. Therefore, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace so that we might receive mercy and find grace to help in our time of need. I'm going to read that last little verse there. Let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace that we will receive mercy and find grace, divine empowerment for our time of need. Has anybody in here ever had to talk to someone in authority and found themselves nervous about it? Anybody? About half of us? You have to go talk to your boss about something, but they didn't let you know what they want to talk to you about, right? That sense of impending doom can easily come, can't it? Or here's, my, here's a, 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 a recent and favorite one, right? You go to the mailbox, and you're sorting through, and then there's uh, an envelope there, and it says, your beloved neighbor, the IRS, <laughs> little letter to you. Isn't it funny? Those in here who have paid taxes long enough, you know that those three little letters in the corner of an envelope can mean anything. And so it's easy for our little heart palpitations to begin for people. Like, oh, geez, what did I do? Is this good? Is this bad? Is this a check? Is this a request for payment? I don't know what's about to happen to me, right? And so we feel this little nervousness. Anytime you approach authority, if you don't know what to expect, it is very easy to have a sense of anxiousness. Every one of us knows this one. I had this, this, uh, this happen to me when I was in the service in the military. I got a message from my commander that he wanted me to report to his office. Now, there are a few ways that you can be invited into your commander's office. Okay? 
to report to your commander's office is not the good one. Okay, if, if you get a message that says, hey, I want to talk to you, okay, this is informal. This is like you can knock on the door and say, hey, sir, what's up, right? You, you can show up, you know, for a meeting that the commander is going to be in. This is my commanding officer. He was a colonel at the time, all right? This is somebody who has been in the service a long time, and he has the power to destroy my life. Authority sometimes has the power to do harm or to do good. My commander could absolutely, he doesn't need any excuse. He could make a decision and it would ruin my future. That's the kind of power a person like that has. And I got this notice. Commander, his name was Brooks. Commander Brooks, you know, would like you to report to his office. Now that phrase means that I show up 15 minutes early, I am sitting outside, I am waiting for the very moment that he feels like looking my direction. It is all based on him. He's setting the tone for this meeting, not me. His agenda, not mine, and he has not told me anything about it. And so when, the, when his, his assistant says, okay, the commander would like you to report now, what that means is coming to the doorway, the threshold, never entering in, standing at the position of attention, knocking. And he may intentionally, and this is exactly what happened, he waited intentionally, ignoring me for a while. Just busy doing his work. And there I am, locked at the position of attention. Till finally, he's like, you know, Sergeant Van Gelder, come in. To report means to come in few paces into the room, stand at the position of attention, salute, and give your reporting statement. Sir, Sergeant Van Gelder reports as ordered. And then you hold the salute and the position of attention until he acknowledges it. And then at that point, he may or may not say, at ease. In this case, he did not. <laughs> yeah, you can tell that something's wrong here. And I didn't know what I was reporting for. And it turns out that a few of my buddies, the guys that I hang out with, had been getting in trouble recently. And the colonel wanted to know why my friends keep getting in trouble and why I hadn't done anything about it. He looked at my life and saw leadership and said, this is your problem, Sergeant Van Gelder. It's not my problem. I'm making it your problem. If they get demoted, if they go to jail, so do you. I hadn't done anything wrong. Interesting situation. To say that my knees weren't knocking would be a lie. I am nervous. I have zero confidence before this throne of authority. Zero. No leg to stand on. The king of the universe, the God of all, the creator of all, the one who has more authority, he has, when, when Jesus walks in the room, the weight of his authority throws people to the ground because you cannot stand. When angels that are simply in his presence come to talk to people, people fall as dead men on the ground, and they're not even the ones that carry the authority. They just have been touched by his authority. The weight of God's authority is so beyond anything. It's the kind of authority that makes the whole universe lock in step and do its things without any hesitation. It just all is kept in perfect order. Why? By the weight of his authority. And that's the one that says to you, I want you to boldly, with confidence, Come before my throne. Why? Because I have sympathy for you. See, with my commander, he had no sympathy for me. <laughs> he could care less what my situation was. He was making it my problem. But that is not the way that Jesus handles it. See, this is how Jesus is towards you. See, Jesus 
had been tempted in all things, Jesus knew exactly what you went through, and he understands it fully, and he has sympathy for you. And that's why he's saying, I want you to have confidence. He's not asking you to report. He's saying, come before me with confidence. Why? Because I can sympathize with your weakness. And when you get here, you're going to find mercy and you're going to find grace. I was having a conversation with my dear friend, Pastor Jim Keene, yesterday. And Jim said something. He, he, said, he said, mercy resurrects dead things. Mercy resurrects dead things. This is what mercy does. See, when you screwed up and you have to come before the king... First of all, he has sympathy, but secondly, his mercy will rewrite the situation so that even though there should be major consequences, even though there should not be a second chance, when his mercy touches it, it resurrects the opportunity, and now it's like a do-over, and it doesn't have any baggage with it. He just rewrites it. Boom, here's a fresh opportunity. The one that you messed up, maybe that's dead and gone, but there's one coming where you're going to get a second opportunity. Why? Because his mercy has made a way. Okay, maybe you messed up. Maybe you really screwed up your previous path, but when you approach the throne of grace, his mercy will cause the opportunity to be resurrected in your future. There is another opportunity coming. But you got to come before the throne of grace. Is anybody alive today? When grace touches your life, he gives you the power to overcome and to take action that you couldn't do before. The grace all of a sudden gives you the ability to, to succeed where you failed. All the reasons why you should come boldly before his throne. The king of the universe wants you to come in with confidence. The king of the universe is inviting you in. The king of the universe has mercy for you. He's not coming with judgment. That's not his, towards you. His mercy is towards you. So can I ask you a question? Why does it take you so long to go there when you mess up? Why did it take you so long to go there when you messed up? Why is God the, sort of the last person? I think we go, oh God, please forgive me. We got that one down pack. But oh God, please forgive me doesn't rewrite your history and doesn't give you a fresh opportunity and doesn't give you the power you need to make the next step. You need mercy, not just forgiveness. Does he forgive you? Absolutely. No, you need mercy. Mercy, mercy is what, what satisfies divine justice. Mercy resurrects the, the thing that was dead and gone. It changes everything. Why did it take us so long to go there? When we don't know what to expect, or we don't have confidence, we get nervous, we get anxious. It's hard to receive something when you're not sure you even have access. How do I boldly receive the very solution to my future when I'm not sure I should even be here? Friends, the Lord wants to do a work in your heart today. He wants to do something in you that convinces you that you are supposed to be before this throne. And not only that, he's beckoning you to come. Not only that, this is your lawful and right positioning. You are supposed to come before this throne. Why? Because he wants to give you a redo, a fresh opportunity, and he wants to give you the power to accomplish and to become the person you're supposed to be. People don't always do that. People are a lot harder than God sometimes. But don't worry. His mercy will help you. Are you alive today? Anybody needing to hear this? Yeah, a few of us, three of you. We should, okay, the ones in the back that said, yes, you should come up forward here. I'll talk to you, okay? Everybody else, here you go, okay? Listen, this word's for us today. God's going to do something in your heart, do something in your life. I, um, I almost missed my prom. Junior year, I had asked this incredibly gorgeous lady to go to the prom with me. She was a senior, right? It's my one chance, right? And uh, 
She said yes, and so it was this event was going to be uh, downtown in one of uh, the mansions, uh, um, and and it was this awesome. It was going to be a really fun event, and so um, so we got all dudded up. I bought the tickets. I talked to my buddy and said, "Hey, how do you get there?" He gave me directions. I've got the tickets. We 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 on the night we get all all spruced up. I'm out a tuxedo on. She puts a beautiful gown on. Um, I didn't have a lot of money back then, and so what I decided to do was serve her dinner. And so we, uh, my, my mom actually helped me, and we made this really amazing spread, and I cooked the food, and it was like this really beautiful and fun experience. The girl married me in the end, so I think I won, right? <laughs> so, so actually, we have a few. Where are those at there? You can go ahead and put the pictures up. Anybody? You got him? No? Try? Okay. All right. Well, I have pictures. Maybe I'll put them up on Facebook or something. We'll put them on social media. So I have pictures from those days. And uh, we... Oh, there you go. There she is. All right. Come on, dude. Next one. Yeah. And there I am serving dinner. Yeah. Ha, 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 ha. Yeah. <laughs> Who wouldn't want to marry that? Yeah. <laughs> so we had dinner and we, uh, we got in the car and we were going to drive to this downtown mansion. And it's just this fun night, a really fun night planned. And, and we get on the road and we're driving on the freeway and I get to the exit and I take the exit. And then as I'm taking the exit, something comes crashing into my consciousness. The thing that comes crashing into my consciousness is I asked another 17-year-old how to get there. And the answer was, you take this exit, and then you take the first left and the second right, and then go for a while, and then you'll see it on the left. <laughs> hmm. And so I take the exit, and I take the first left, and then as I'm driving on the street, I'm asking myself, was that the left, or is it the next left? And we end up spending the next hour driving around looking for this experience. How many know that it's actually not a fun experience to just be wandering around trying to figure this thing out? It wasn't good. So I'm getting frustrated. We begin to ask directions. So I'm stopping, popping out at the little, you know, the different supermarket stores. And I'm asking people, and people don't know what we're talking about. They've never heard of this place before, this little event center, blah, blah, blah. On and on the story goes, and it's not succeeding and finally, we call, we get out and, you know, use a pay phone because cell phones don't exist back then. Cell phones are this big <laughs> when we were in school. And, and so we, we end up getting directions. And we finally find the place and we go up in there and basically the event's over. We missed it. We got one dance, right? We went in. All our friends are gone, but there's a few people remaining. The music's still playing, so we, got, we did one dance. We got back in the car, and we went home. That was our prom, okay? I, but I win, right? I won because I got the girl forever, so it's good. But, but where I went wrong was asking a peer how to get where I'm trying to go. Asking a peer, someone who's never been there themselves, hey, how do I do this? Can I tell you that this is where a lot of lives go wrong? We get advice and we get input from people who have never been there themselves. And so the marriage is burning down. I love the I love the power and the excitement and the passion with newly married people. Every one of them think that they're going to have a blog that explains to the rest of the world how to do marriage. <laughs> I'm ready to write the book. I've been married six months, but I have the, I have the memoir that's going to explain to everyone else how to do this. God bless your zeal. God bless your passion. You don't know what you're talking about. 
The new parent has all these theories on the way you're supposed to do things. But none of it is real. It's all in your head. Why? Because you've not proven it. You don't know what you're talking about. You go to other peers, people that are in the same situation looking for advice. Can I tell you that people on the same journey at the same point in your life do not have wisdom for you? They can cheer you on. They're great confidants. They're the ones you take the journey with, but they make lousy mentors. You don't seek advice from people that are two minutes ahead of you. Your marriage support group is not people in the same place of life as you. You need help. Help is not coming from somebody who got married six months ago. I'm being real with y'all. Why? Because I pastor the mistakes. I get to clean up the messes, and I'm sick of it. When you get a dream opportunity and the job finally comes along, the person that you are seeking advice from in your job shouldn't be the guy who got hired with you. Again, they make wonderful companions and friends, but they make lousy mentors. Hello? See, I am absolutely convinced that God knows exactly what you need and that God knows how to get you there. But when we're convinced we know the way ourselves, when we're convinced that the little bit of advice we picked up along the way, the directions to the place, until you're finally in the situation where you need to apply this wisdom, you don't realize it until it's too late. Wait a second. I need help. Okay, repeat after me. I need help. That is a powerful statement. That statement right there will, will absolutely transform your future. See, when you are unable to recognize that you need help, it's called naivety. You're naive. You think you don't need it. But you don't know what you don't know. You're naive. There's another camp. It's called the fool. The fool knows that they need help, but they refuse to ask for it because they're convinced they know better. They're a fool. The fool and the naive person end up with the same result, destroyed futures. They get the same thing. This guy over here doesn't know that he needs help, but he ends up with a destroyed future. Why? Because he needed help. He's just ignorant to it. This guy over here chose not to get help, even though he knew he needed help. He just chose not to. Why? Because I'm big enough. I'm strong enough. I can do it all on my own. Something in the American culture, something in our hearts, something weird is going on with this younger generation where we think that we know the way, but you've never been there before. And you're heading for destruction and hard times, but because God loves you, he put you in this church to hear this sermon You need help. All of us do. You cannot do it on your own. You're not supposed to do it on your own. You're never supposed to do it on your own. And all the blue ribbons and trophies that say that you're good enough doesn't mean anything when it comes down to having to actually run the race of life. Get input. Get help. Seek out others' inputs. Don't try to do this alone. Is anybody alive today? Life is not a solo sport. Success is, not a, success is a team activity. No such thing as the Lone Ranger in the kingdom. No superstars. None of that. Every one of us need people. Amen? Amen. Capitalizing on your destiny requires asking for help. Once the marriage has crashed, it's too late. God's mercy can resurrect dead things, and so don't give up hope, but if you don't ask for help sometime soon, it will be too late. That's a word for someone in here. Start to ask for help. Get others involved. Amen.
This is James chapter 1. I love this verse. It's one of my favorite verses in the Bible. James 1.5. What an incredible promise. Look at this. If any of you lacks wisdom, okay, wisdom is knowing what to do. I don't know what to do. If anyone lacks wisdom, what should you do? Let him ask God, help. That's a godly prayer right there. That's a wise prayer. Oh, God, help me. Let him ask of God, who gives to all generously without reproach, and it will be given to him. That's incredible. Without reproach means we're not going to look at all the reasons why you did dumb and all the reasons why you're in trouble. We're just going to give you help. Okay? Doesn't matter how you got here. We're just moving you forward. There's mercy. Come on. Let's pick it up and let's move forward. Okay? You are where you are and there's no reason to stay stuck. Let's do this. God gives wisdom. He wants to help us. I think sometimes there's a misunderstanding in the scripture, though, and I think it's an American thing. Um, But when we pray for wisdom, the expectations is that God will supernaturally impart wisdom to us so that now we don't need anybody because we have the answer. Right? I'm stuck. I go, God, help me. He gives me wisdom, and I get to move forward without anybody else's help. As if that's the, what the scripture's promising, but that's not what happens. See, God is a genius, and he knows that you need people in your life. And so, so often, this is how it works. You get stuck. You go, oh, God, help me. I need your wisdom. Please show me what to do. And what he does is he brings a person into your life. And that person has the solution. And it's really hard to see if you're prideful. If you're convinced you know the way, it's really difficult to see those kind of people in your life. They actually have the solution, but you don't want to ask them. And this is my favorite one, okay? Well, you're stuck, and God brings the solution, and it's the person who annoys you most. (laughs) Isn't that awesome? He's just like, I think God and the angels are up there going, watch this. (laughs) This is going to be fun. And so the Lord brings his grace in the form of a person. And how we access his grace is through humility. See, it says that God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. How does that work? See, humble people ask for help when they get stuck. And so God brings the solution in a person. And when you go humble, you start asking people for help. And then you found out that God put the solution right next to you. And because you are approaching it with humility, you're able to see it. Come on now. I'm telling you good news. I don't know if your face knows that yet, but we're getting there. As a young leader, um, I came out of the service, and I had a successful career. I I did really well. And I got promoted, and I was given lots of responsibility, and I was seen as a leader, and I would win leadership awards, and, like, that thing was real in me. And I came out of the service, and uh, the Lord sent Nicole and I back to Minnesota. And we knew it was from God that we were to move back here. And uh, I needed a job. I had a young family. I'm going to school full time, but I still needed income coming in. And so I asked my father. And my dad was a pastor of a large denominational church. And uh, he said, "Um, we have somebody who is stepping out of a director position, and we need someone to fill it. I think he'd be perfect. So he hired me to be the director of Alpha. Anybody know Alpha? The Alpha Ministry. It's this program that walks people from, you know, just through their faith journey to help to realize the truth of the scriptures. And it's an awesome program. And so it was a great opportunity. And so he just put me right into it, like, boom, director. And, and we're, we're heading towards the launch date. And, and our church at the time had hundreds of people going through the Alpha program. And it had to be God. It had to be the Holy Spirit. Because there was a day where I was planning and this little alarm started going off in the back of my head. Boop, boop, boop. You don't know what you're doing. <laughs> like, I can see the date approaching. I know I'm supposed to be leading a course then. There's people signed up. Boop, boop, boop. You need help. You're not going to be able to do this on your own. 
Like hundreds of people require lots of volunteers. Boop, boop, boop. You haven't asked anybody for help. Had to be God. Something in me is going, I need help because I've never done this before. Now, my superpower is my ability to believe that I can do anything. <laughs> it's my superpower. If I can see it, I can achieve it. It's my superpower. Like, that's just who I am. If, if, if I get vision for something, we're heading that direction and nothing can stop us, okay? And so I had vision for this course, but I'd never been there before. I had confidence, but I never actually. Here's the question. Do you have to go through the crash of failure before you learn the lesson, or is it possible to gain the knowledge of what you need before you try? Can you? If you're going to grow from it, if you're going to step into something, then you need to slow down and ask questions first. Grow in it first. Seek help first. And so this is what happened. It had to be the divine hand of God on me. I looked around. I stopped. I went, whoa, I don't know what I'm doing. I need to ask for help. And I looked at the people, and the person who was stepping out of that position had successfully ran several of those courses. And so I went to her, and I said, I humbled myself. I said, I've never done this before. I am a little child. I don't know how to do this. Will you please help me to, to succeed? I humbled myself. And she said, I would absolutely be willing to help you. Now, she was leaving on bad terms. But because I went low, I created a bridge for her to help me. For weeks, she walked right by my side, and she would model what we are supposed to do on week one, and then I would do it. And she would model week two, and then I would do it. And she walked me through a whole course. By the end of it, I got it. I knew. I was confident. was able to move forward. And at that point, I was able to start making the improvements, the things that I could see that she couldn't see, right? Can I give you just a, this is like fatherly advice. When you get an opportunity, don't just step into it and start changing things. You should probably learn how to do the role first. Young people get really excited. People, in general, get really excited about an opportunity because they go, man, I'm going to get to put my mark on something. You should first step fully into the role. You should first become the thing that they've asked you to become before you try to start changing things. And everybody who's been fired before said, amen. <laughs> That's the quickest way out of a company. You refuse to do what they ask you to do. You're doing something else. Quickest way out of a company. You got hired for something, and you didn't do it. Bye. Just telling you. Right? That's that lump right there, that one. <laughs> Talking to you. <laughs> okay. So I do this, and the course goes amazing. We have tons of volunteers, and the thing's improving, and I'm able to pour my heart out in it and sustain it, and the leadership thing in me rises to the occasion, and things are going great. We have, we have several years of courses. Hundreds and hundreds of people come to Jesus. Incredible experience for me. Solidified leadership in me, and all of it happened because at the beginning of a place of crisis, when I had never done it before, I decided to ask for help. Fast forward, as I'm growing to the end of that role, I had started a men's group that met on Tuesday mornings, and it was the, some of the leaders that were in that Alpha course. And, and these are people that I had asked to help me do Alpha, and then I wanted to keep on a journey with them. And so I started this men's group on Tuesday mornings, and several of them, Josh Johnson, Steve Smith, his brother Jim, there were several of them. And they were the core launching team for this church. See, this is how opportunities work. This is how God works. In the place of humility, you can get established in something, and then God can add to it. When you're given an opportunity, instead of just, yes, I can do it, I'm equal to the task, instead of trying to, trying to be something, just go low, receive from others, grow. Ask for help first. 
ask for help. You're in your marriage. Things are going great. I love that things are going great. Do you know why they're going great? I can promise you, you don't. <laughs> You're an entrepreneur. Things are going great. That's awesome. Now something breaks. You don't know how to fix it. You know why you don't know how to fix it? Because you don't know why it was going great. You don't know why. So you're changing things. And you change things and it just keeps going worse and worse and worse. And you don't know how to fix it. Why don't you know how to fix it? Because you didn't ask for help to begin with. You didn't get established in it to begin with. You got lucky. Church, listen to me. The Lord wants to heap his wisdom on you. And he touches people and individuals and takes them through stuff. And then God takes you and puts you in a situation and surrounds you with his wisdom in people. And if we will go low and will honor one another and receive from one another, then we all can emerge. Just like last week, I preached on the preacher's tree. I'm saying to you, you are supposed to stand up in your community and offer something significant to the world around you. But you cannot get there unless you go low first. Humility. Repeat after me. I will ask for help. You got to say it in a robotic voice. I will ask for help. Listen. And can I tell you that Siri doesn't count? <laughs> Isn't that what you're doing right now? You don't know how to do something? Where's the first place you go? YouTube. Where's the instructional video? There's no grace on YouTube. I'm not making a joke. Grace comes from people. Impartation comes from people. God wants you to connect with people. He doesn't want information. You need transformation. He's trying to give you wisdom. Wisdom comes from people. It's not information. Information can show you how to do something. Wisdom will transform your life. I love the story of Solomon. You remember this? God comes to Solomon in a dream. Anybody want this to happen to them? Like, it's the... It's the it's the question of all questions. Like, God comes to you, right? And he says, anything you want, I'll give it to you. Here Solomon is. He's become king. And God comes to him in a dream and says, Solomon, anything you want, it's yours. What does he ask for? I can hear it whispering through. Wisdom, wisdom, wisdom. No, it's not what he did. It's not what he did. We say wisdom because that's the result. Know what he asked for? This is what the prayer went like. He said this. He said, God, I am a little child, and I don't even know how to come in and go out among your people. I know nothing about the role you gave me. I don't know what to do. Help me. That was his prayer. You want your life to be transformational? Start there. Stop pretending like you know what to do. You don't. Your destiny's over here. How are you going to get there? Well, I'm going to do X, Y, Z. All right. Well, I can tell you you're not going to get there. It has to start with going low. And I don't know why it's so hard for us, but it's hard. I, I, I think sometimes that it might be the fear factor in us of like, how will people perceive me if I ask for help? Maybe it's that I don't want to be diminished in your sight, and so if I admit that I don't know what I'm doing, then I'm going to feel like somehow my reputation will be lower. I have to fake it till I make it. You know, that's a phrase that we use a lot of times. Like, there are, there are all sorts of things, I think, that, that keep us from asking, from seeking, and from finding, frankly. There is significant outpouring and blessing that's waiting for you. But it starts with, I don't know what the heck I'm doing. That's an amazing prayer. God, I don't know what the heck I'm doing. Please help me. Proverbs 8 1. Love this verse. Woohoo! You ready? 
Proverbs 8, 1. Does not wisdom call and understanding lift up her voice? Doesn't wisdom call out and understanding lift up her voice? I used to read this verse as, as if wisdom was this preacher standing on the corner and telling everybody all the things it knows. <laughs> Who's the wisest person in your life? Isn't it the know-it-all? Isn't it the one that tells you everything? Isn't that the wisest person in your life? The one who stands up and, you should do this, and gives you all this free advice. You should do this, and you should do this. You should do that. Non-stop talking. Right? They're the preacher, right? Isn't that what wisdom is? Or is that information? Can I tell you today that wisdom comes in question form, not in answer form? The call of wisdom is to ask a question. How do I do this? Proceeds wisdom. When someone stands up and says, I know what to do, that's not wisdom. So when it says, does, or you can leave that back up there, please. When it says, does not wisdom call and understanding lift up her voice, that is not someone proclaiming, you should do this, and here's why. Tell them what they won, Bob. <laughs> that's not wisdom, and that's not understanding. Wisdom and understanding call out like this. Hey, how do you do this? Hey, why should I do that? Hey, I don't know how to fill in the blank. Here comes wisdom. Understanding. Doesn't she lift up her voice? How does understanding lift up her voice? It sounds like this. How and why are we doing this? Help me to understand. It is seeking understanding. It is asking questions. That's where wisdom's voice begins to talk to you. It's not by proclaiming you know. Knowledge is something that proceeds after this. You've got to ask the question first. You want to be wise? I want you to be wise. I think that this generation is called to be Daniels, called to be Josephs, prophetic messengers that God brings alongside of the world's leaders. And when the world's leaders do not know what to do, they'll ask the question, and you will be standing there having pursued God. And in the moment, the answer will come through the prophetic messengers of this day, and we'll see this world turn around. Amen. Friends, that's who you are. You're called to come alongside that boss of yours. Instead of saying to your boss, I know the way, you should just do what I do. Instead of, you like that? <laughs> like, howdy doody. Instead of just getting into your job and trying to change things because obviously the boss doesn't know what they're doing. So we should just do it my way because if we do it my way, then it'll turn out better. Instead of doing all that garbage, which by the way is the way to a pink slip and exiting the company. Instead of doing that, I want you to succeed. And success looks like this. You show up at work on Monday and you go see your supervisor and you say, listen, I know these have been hard times. And I know that I don't know everything, but I would love to help you achieve whatever you're trying to achieve right now. So what, where are we struggling? What do we need? Where can I add value? How can I help you? How can I come alongside you? See, 2020 was difficult for every single corporation, every company. No one was, no one got away with it. All of them, even the successful ones now have major problems. So even if somebody was successful, they still find themselves with major questions of how do, we make, how do we move forward? This is a new world. What do we do? Friends, that's why God put you there. That's why God put you there. Because the Lord wants to speak to you. He wants to use you. But you've got you to gotta go low. If you come in on your horse telling everybody what to do, it won't work. Even if you have the right answers, that's not the approach. Come in low. Ask for help. Seek understanding. Grow. And then the Lord is going to position you to bring transformation.
It's how he does it every time. It's how he did it through history. That's what he'll do again. And he wants to use you to do it. Anybody alive this morning? If you're an expert at something, let me encourage you to become a novice again. Experts are the ones that are going to be waiting down for food stamps. Experts have no business in this new generation. There's no such thing as an expert today. Only people that are wise, and wise people start asking questions because we don't know how to do it next. We should grow. Amen. <laughs> Woo! Here's the deal. We're going to close today with an activation. So we are turning our hearts. We have tuned in, and we're saying to the Lord, God, we need help. Now, every person in here today came with something. There's a need. you got some need in your life. I can't tell you what it is, but I do know that the Lord strategically places you among people that have answers. So this is what I would like us to do today. I'm going to ask us to get into groups of two or three, not four, not five, not one, okay? Groups of two or three. The reason is if you get in a group of four, it's going to take you an hour to do, okay? If you get in a group of two, then you can pray for one another. A group of three is great because you can agree with others. But you're going to share something, a need in your life. Not the back story. There's no time for that. <laughs> but you, so you're going to have to quantify it into one statement. My family really needs breakthrough in our finances. Period. And then we're going to pray for one another. And we're going to watch God meet us in this place today. You might say to me, Pastor Jamie, I'm just visiting just visiting. <laughs> I ain't trying to do all that. Okay. Time out. Hold on. Maybe that's the reason you're here. Okay. I don't need you to play, pray some super hyper spiritual prayer. The prayer is this. God, please help them. That's it. God, please help them. Amen. I know you can do that. Okay. Every one of us can do that. All right, so we're going to turn some music on. We're going to get in groups of two or three. I'm actually going to release you. I'm going to bless you right now. Now, if I see people bolt for the door, don't worry. I'm quicker. I'm going to be standing out there. <laughs> I'm going to make you look me in the eye and say bye, okay, if you bolt out of here without praying for somebody, all right? Listen, just do it. Seriously, it'll be a blessing to you. It'll be a blessing to others. It doesn't need to be heavy. We're just literally just, just lifting each other up, Okay. All right. Father, I thank you for this people. I thank you that you minister among us and that you love each one. And I thank you even for the person that's terrified right now of having to pray for someone, that you're going to meet them where they're at. I thank you for the prophetic ministry that's going to take place and the ease that this is going to flow in. And now we just invite you into it, Lord. So I just bless this people. May the Lord bless you and keep you, shine his face upon you, grant you grace, be gracious to you, grant you peace be with you, promote you, strengthen you, give you wisdom. I bless you, church, in Jesus' name. All right, would you please look around, just grab one or two people that are just sitting around you. Okay, you're just going to pray for each other real quick. Hey, what can I pray for? That simple. We're going to put some music on in the background. It's real easy. Don't freak out. You'll be fine. Trust me, it'll be over before you know it. As soon as you're done praying, you're welcome to take off. God bless you guys.